Sophie Volp, Chair of the Center for Chinese Studies. I'm very happy today to introduce Judith Zeitlin, William R. Kennan, Jr., Professor of East Asian Languages and Civilizations at the University of Chicago. She's the author of The Phantom Heroine, Ghosts and Gender in 17th Century Chinese Literature, and Historian of the Strange, Pu Songling, and the Classical Chinese Tale. Judith is also co-editor of three volumes, The Voice is Something More, Essays Towards Materiality, Thinking with Cases, Specialist Knowledge in Chinese Cultural History, and Writing and Materiality in China. I'm your discussant today. Welcome, Judith. Thank you, Sophie. Um, I'm very happy to be here, um, or at least here virtually. And I want to thank uh, Sophie for the invitation, for the wonderful staff at the Center for Chinese Studies, Xiao Jie and Sky, who have allayed my worries at every moment. Um, and um, I just uh, like to begin. I'm very excited to be presenting this to you. And uh, I hope you'll enjoy it and you'll have questions for me in the Q&A. Um, so the title of my talk is Fantasies of Porcelain from Voyage to the Western Ocean to Ballet de Porcelain. The catalyst for this talk is my involvement with the project Reimagining the Ballet de Porcelain a French pantomime ballet, also known as the Teapot Prince. The ballet premiered at the height of the European chinoiserie craze in 1739 at the Chateau de Morville outside of Paris. It was performed in 17, it was last performed in 1741 until early last December when it premiered at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and this month when it was performed at the University of Chicago on March 2nd and 3rd. The ballet had languished in the archives until being ba brought back to life um, by the NYU French art historian Meredith Martin in a new experimental um, production brilliantly co-created by Martin and Phil Chan, a choreographer and Asian American activist who co-founded the organization Final Bow for Yellowface to work on getting ballet companies to stop perpetuating anti-Asian racist stereotypes in their work. I, a, a sort of a classic example is The Nutcracker, which I imagine you've all seen. And he's done wonders in getting ballet companies around the world to pledge to um, re-choreograph those sections. Phil brought on an immensely talented team of artists of Asian descent, including Georgina Gina Paskogin, his co-founder of Final Bow, and Daniel Applebaum, both soloists of the New York City Ballet, to play the prince and princess. He also brought in the very talented costume designer, Harriet Jung, the composer, Sugar Vendel, for supplementary music and sound, and many others. In the original ballet, an evil Chinese sorcerer on an enchanted island transforms people into porcelain, including a handsome young prince who trespasses on the island. His beloved, a beautiful princess, comes in search of him and by stealing the sorcerer's wand, breaks the spell and transforms the teapot prince back into a human being, thus demonstrating the rather unremarkable lesson that love conquers all. In the anonymous fairy tale upon which the ballet's libretto is based, the sorcerer gets his comeuppance by being transformed into a grotesque porcelain figurine popular in 18th century Europe called a pagode. Meredith and Phil's production brilliantly twists the evil sorcerer role by modeling him after the obsessive porcelain collector Augustus II, ruler of Saxony, and having him transformed into a pagode. So in the, um, the slide here, this, this picture here, is actually the book cover for the accompanying volume that Meredith has edited. And um, it's the, the amazing picture you see is actually not of a performance of the ballet, but a photo shoot taken in the Venetian room of the French embassy in New York. But it gives you a, a wonderful view of the three protagonists. Um, you see the um, with his sort of um, bared uh, shoulder and chest, you see the porcelain prince. You see played by Daniel Applebaum in the center. You see the porcelain princess played by, although she actually never turns into into porcelain in the in the ballet or in the. Um, or in the original fairy tale, but I think that's kind of the, the costume designer's license. And then um, 
the the sort of really comical looking figure is the is the sorcerer after he's been turned into a pagod he's um making these grotesque um movements as opposed to the elegant uh, movements of the of the two principles he's still wearing he's augustus the second sort of 18th century style wig and he's wearing a pagod mask i want to show you a little bit of the ballet to give you a feeling before i go on so this was taken um, live in a performance, the performance in Chicago, which was performed in a black box theater. Um, and here, what you see are the um, is the sorcerer in his you know 18th century drag, um, and the porcelain prince before he's turned into porcelain, wearing his gauzy green robe. They're having a kind of standoff, uh, the prince with a knife or sword, and the um, um, sorcerer with his wand. Of course, the the porcelain prince loses and gets turned into porcelain in the next slide. So here we are back in the Venetian room. I just love this slide very much. So you see the, the prince um, now in, turned into porcelain, wearing his porcelain mask, and the princess who's just discovered him sadly behind him. These gesture, this weird gesture that he's making with the fingers up in the air is an 18th century ballet gesture that was used to mark Chineseness. For various reasons, you could still see it in an in a in a unreconstructed chore choreographed um, version of the Nutcracker. Um, so a lot of these um, ballet moves still on many stages in the 20th century can be traced back to 18th century representations. And so this is back in Chicago in the Black Box Theater. Um, you can see um, the uh, the sorcerer um, being transformed. Did I mention he's played by Tyler Hines, Haynes um, being transformed into the pagod? You can see uh, the princess behind you who I've thought rather mysteriously strips down into this kind of glittery gold body suit. But I think the idea is she's representing the kind of essence of porcelain of the, called the arcanum, which is the chemical formula. Behind her, you can see, and I think you may have seen this earlier, you can see the, or, the ensemble of five instruments who are also dressed as porcelain. And um, I'll explain a little bit more um, why that is. Um, this Baroque ensemble um, in the original libretto designates the servants of the household to wear cardboard costumes to stand in for a porcelain forest. So Harriet Jung designed costumes for the, for the, the musicians to stand in for this um, porcelain forest. So this pagode, which in fact, I had never even heard of this term, um, it obviously derives from pagoda, um, until Meredith introduced it to me, but it's a European um, figure that derives from Chinese statuettes of the Buddhist monk Budai. And on the top, you can see a very familiar looking, um, you know, this is a, a Qing a porcelain figure of uh, Budai, who was a medieval um, a Buddhist mon monk. Um, on the um, the far side, the painting is a detail from a Ming Dynasty hand scroll showing the court celebration of the Lantern Festival. And um, this is a uh, like a push cart, a peddler with toys to um, give to the children. And what really fascinated me, I don't know if you can see it on the slide, but um, on the corner, I guess I can't really, is a tiny little Budai figure, and which suggests to me that it is a comic, might have comic connotations in Chinese case as well, just by its juxtaposition with the Lantern Festival and these various toys. And then the last figure there is a, um, is a pagod manufactured by my, the Meissen Manufactory, which was the first in Europe to be able to um, make real porcelain. So this is from the 1730s and 40s, and it has a nodding head and arms. Um, and that again, also stimulated 18th century representations um, of Chinese, so-called Chinese dancers in ballet and opera. Um, and then finally, you see the pagode mask designed by Harriet Jung for the sorcerer in Ballet de Porcelain. 
So how did I get involved in this project, which I have to say has been an amazing journey? Um, well, Meredith contacted me early on in her process um, because someone had mentioned me and my work on animating the inanimate in Chinese literature and the research I did was doing on the relationship between Chinese ghosts, material culture and Chinese opera. And uh, immediately when she told me about this project, I got, you know, kind of, I sort of wanted to be a part of it. And what especially attracted me and has continues to attract me is the experimental nature of her project to reimagine the Ballet de Porcelaine on several fronts, to take seriously the transcultural nature of this work transposed in time and space for one thing, and not to try and do a simple reconstruction, but rather a historically informed, and it's very historically informed thanks to the research of Meredith and Phil, aid from um, a specialist in Baroque dance and so on. So they did a historically in formed reconfiguration of the piece to revel in the Baroque spirit of it but, and to capture the original magic of porcelain at that time, but in a way that counters problematic assumptions and anti-Chinese stereotyping, stereotyping in line with, I think, you know, what a 21st century audience needs in the current context of the politics of race. And so you've already seen the plot twist, uh, you've already seen some of the costumes and so on. And I think another reason that the ballet itself is very well suited to this kind of reimagining is because no choreography designs or eyewitness accounts of the performance are extant. So it really gives, I think, these co-creators a lot of freedom. Um, the ballet itself is very short. It's designed as a 15 to 20 minute divertissement or an interlude for one thing. And all that survives, and this is important that something survives, are the musical score and the libretto which provides stage directions, musical cues, cryptic costume instructions, and two poems to be recited for the prelude and the epilogue, but not much else. And so, as I said, that gives you just an, gives you enough to work with, plus a lot from the material culture and other materials for ballets um, of the period. Um, so, but there's a lot of freedom to re-choreograph and rethink it artistically. So my talk today is a version of an essay that I wrote that's being published in Meredith's edited volume about the ballet, whose cover you saw in my very first slide. And it's a, a beautiful volume. I'm very happy to be in it. As the only China specialist involved with this project of the Ballet de Porcelaine or the volume, um, in my um, contribution and what I'll talk to you about today was to explore the magic of porcelain as a fantastic and phantasmatic material, but from Chinese sources. I moved to my first real section of the paper, which I'm calling Porcelain Diplomacy, Zheng He's Voyage to the Western Ocean. Sometime between 1433 when the eunuch admiral, admiral goodness, Zheng He made his final maritime expedition to the Indian Ocean and South China Sea, and 1522, an anonymous opera script celebrating his exploits entitled, for short, Voyage to the Western Ocean, was deposited in the Ming Palace Theater Bureau. So you see here um, uh, a uh, reprint of the manuscript that was copied out in the Ming Dynasty, um, and you see the first page. We don't know if this opera was ever actually performed, though there's no reason it wouldn't have been. In her recent book, Leanna Chen rightly sees it as a precursor of the tribute paying theatricals performed on diplomatic and ceremonial occasions at the Qing court the kind prepared for Lord McCartney in 1793 during his diplomatic embassy from Great Britain to China. Such spectacular pageants typically included signs of foreign envoys flocking to the Chinese court to present accolades and rare treasures as an act of submission to the ruling dynasty and its cultural and moral superiority. They were not so unlike the Ballet des Nations, genre, which was popular at the 17th and 18th century French court, which featured performers exotically costumed as princes from around the world, including China, extolling the virtues and beauties of France. So um, I was quite amused to find this counterpart. In a comic interlude in Voyage to the Western Ocean, barbarian rulers of three island kingdoms, 
Sulu in the Philippines, Pahang in Malaysia, and a mythical land of pierced hearts. Desperate to hijack the precious cargo of the Admiral's fleet of treasure boats, convene on the island of disorderly rocks. And the word Luan is used because I think that's a, a sort of a joke because to imply that they are in fact rebellious. So these um, barbarian rulers blockaded ships as a way of exhorting what they most desire, porcelain. As a sign perhaps of their rushes rustic boorishness in Ming Chinese eyes, it isn't the beauty of porcelain dishes that they prize, but the material's utilitarian ability to hold hot and cold substances without cracking. Alternatively, this may simply be a sign of the blasé attitude of the playwright and his court audience towards goods as familiar and abundant as porcelain wares, especially given the indifferent quality of the mass-produced stuff shipped to Southeast Asia, as evinced by the cargo recovered from shipwrecks. And the sheer volume of cargo from the imperial kiln, kiln city of Jingdezhen that um, Zheng He is said to have bought, brought for porcelain diplomacy and trade on his last voyage, 443,500 pieces of ceramics, according to historian Anne Harrison. In any event, the wily admirable admiral easily outwits the rebellious rulers of these wee far-flung kingdoms when they ask him the secret of how precious porcelain is made. Don't you know that in my land, the trees bear porcelain fruit all by themselves? And he invites them on board his flagship so he can give them the matrix of porcelain for their very own, a dwarf specimen of a zi shu, the tree upon which porcelain fruit grows. Unable to resist the temptation to gain such an easy and expedient means of reproducing porcelain, I have to say I'm tempted to say, to get at such low-lying fruit. Anyway, they can't resist obtaining what they call a perennial root, a sugan, to plant themselves. And so the rulers clamor aboard, only to be overpowered at once by the admiral's troops. The admirable admiral mercifully spares their lives after they pledge submission and tribute to the great Ming dynasty. But as punishment, he confiscates the imperial gifts of Chinese goods originally earmarked for them. As one of the disappointed rulers grumbles, we almost lost our heads and ended up without a single piece of porcelain. The play has fun with the naivety and greed of these island kings. Who would really believe that porcelain grows on trees? But it also gets at the wonder and awe that the seemingly magical creation process of Chinese porcelain inspired across the early modern world. And as an aside, I have to say that I think the idea of porcelain, a porcelain tree or porcelain trees is inspired by a coral tree, the shanghu shu, as coral branches are called in Chinese. In another active voyage to the Western Ocean, for instance, coral trees are in fact part of the tribute that the King of Calicut pays to the Ming Emperor. And, um, you know, coral was a typical exotic, precious foreign tribute material that was supposed to be given to the Emperor. So I think it's a logical association. And you'll see in the next slide what makes me think of it. So um, in this detail from a woodblock printed book from the Ming Dynasty, you can see two attendants. In fact, I think the one holding the crackle vase might be a eunuch. And you see it's really, it's supposed to be um, a coral branch, a coral tree in it. But since there's no color, the most prized coral were sort of what they call an oily red. I, doesn't it look like a porcelain tree? It seems really easy to sort of make that kind of logical association. Anyway, um, I like to think of this porcelain, um, this, this porcelain tree being either planted or harvested by that attendant. But it was rival states of early modern Europe who became most obsessed with obtaining the magical secret of manufacturing porcelain called white gold because of the insatiable demand and astronomic prices it commanded there. That is, at least until the early 18th century, when the code of producing hard paste or true porcelain was cracked circa 1710, by alchemist chemists laboring in Augustus the Strong's a laboratory in Saxony. And the friend also the sort of the second source, so that's how Meissen the, is sort of um, founded. 
Um, and the other route in which the real knowledge of true porcelain is transmitted to Europe is through letters sent by the French Jesuit father, D'Entrecol, in 1712 and 1722 from Jing Dezhen, detailing the complete process. So the original performance of the Ballet de Porcelaine was at the height of the European porcelain craze, right? Remember, it's 1739 and 1741, but actually before France had succeeded in birthing its own true porcelain. Um, they were, what they were manufacturing was kind of like Delft. They were manufacturing soft paste porcelain that looked like, was painted and glazed to look like real porcelain. And as Meredith deftly argues in her edited volume, both Caelus's ballet libretto and its fairy tale source simultaneously mask and reveal the European colonial ambition to acquire the magical secret of porcelain creation by beating the Chinese at their own game, that is, by turning China into China, China with a big, with a capital C into China with a small capital. The fantasy of unlimited generation of porcelain dramatized in Voyage to the Western Ocean forms a neat parallel with the ballet and the fairy tale. Recall that in the ballet, an evil sorcerer turns people into porcelain on his island kingdom, effectively killing them by dooming them to a living death, until finally the spell is broken, smashing the porcelain and transforming these decorative objects back into human beings. In the original fairy tale, the teapot prince turns himself into a weapon to attack the sorcerer and smashes himself in a simultaneous act of heroism and self-sacrifice. In both Chinese and French sources, therefore, gaining boundless mastery over porcelain manufacture is linked to the creative and destructive forces of life and death. So, Building on recent art historical scholarship that takes seriously the phantasmatic elements in Chinese accounts of porcelain manufacture, in the remainder of this talk, I'll explore a set of Chinese writing and artworks that imagine porcelain as an uncanny material that can breach the borders between life and death, person and thing, animate and inanimate. Despite or more likely because of its ubiquity, porcelain didn't become an important subject of literary representation in Imperial China, especially compared with Europe. There are no magical Chinese stories of porcelain in implements such as teapots and cups coming to life, a theme which has such a rich history in European fairy tales and the performing arts up through Disney cartoons like Beauty and the Beast, which was actually influenced by, the, um, by this uh, anonymous fairy tale and also even some of the ballets later on were influenced by Ballet de Porcelain. Nor are sorcerers who transform people into inanimate objects typically found in Chinese stories. What we do find are strange tales in which things themselves, especially old or worn out quotidian ones, may shape shift of their own volition to temporarily assume human guise and manifest themselves to ordinary people. Once rediscovered in their original form, smashing, burning, or burying these things suffices to exorcise their demonic spirits. In stories of statues or paintings already fashioned in human form, no transformation of physical likeness is necessary, however, and it's typically the desire of the viewer that animates them and triggers the haunting. Most often, haunting statues in these stories are encountered in temples. Um, they're usually female attendants of goddesses, sometimes goddesses, sometimes even young gods. You know, we could imagine them like this. This is a fa from a famous set of life-sized um, painted earthenware statues um, of an, um, in uh, a Jin um, dynasty temple, the Jin shrine. Um, and uh, on, you also see um, the Guanyin porcelain statue. Um, Guanyin was also sometimes um, likened to a beautiful woman and um, confused in various literary sources with real women. But um, two Tang tales about haunting statues from the later eighth century stand out because they specifically, they specify that they involve porcelain statues, which is especially strange because no porcelain figures from the Tang have been discovered. We only have porcelain vessels from this relatively early period of porcelain's manufacture. I only have time today to tell you about the most interesting of these tales. In this one, the porcelain statue isn't otherwise described, except to say it was of a young woman and had stood in the household of the husband and wife for some time. So I think what's interesting is they don't specify 
you know, the size of the statue. So these are tiny Tang tomb figurines. They're made of porcelain, uh, sort of made of earthenware, um, um, both in the collection of the Met in New York, um, a fashionable court lady in the sort of cool, um, I would wear something like this, uh, you know, in this cool costume and hairdo. Um, and also uh, the attendant in black and white there who is hold the round object she's holding in her hand is a pillow. One day, the, the wife teasingly says to the statue, you should become my husband's concubine. The wrong move, of course, because as in folk tales worldwide, such jokes are dangerous because they come true. Um, and so um, subsequently, the husband falls into a kind of trance or a daze in which he keeps making love with a strange woman in his bed, which is why I show, chose to show you the attendant with the pillow. The haunting is eventually traced back to the porcelain statue, whereupon they smash it open and find blood inside its heart the size of a chicken egg. The story doesn't explain further, but in Chinese medicine, female blood and male essence are the organic material required for reproduction. The uncanny implication here is that the statue is either in the early physiological process of becoming flesh or at an early stage of gestating a human embryo the second possibility reinforced by the egg simile. Such inference makes sense in light of the long tradition of Chinese tales in which sex between a mortal man and supernatural woman may result in bringing her to life or giving birth to a human child. But reading somewhat against the grain, could we interpret this story as a parable about the mesmerizing quality of porcelain as a material, the metamorphic process of its generation, and the extreme fragility of its bodily form? What's clear is that porcelain manufacture was understood in Chinese term as an art of transformation to borrow the title of Ellen Huang's superb article on the mysterious, unintended, and even paranormal qualities imbued in certain Qing dynasty glazes and by extension in Chinese porcelain production more generally. In his letter of 1722, the Jesuit D'Entrecol used the Chinese expression yao bian, followed by the French gloss transmutation to describe a curious looking piece of porcelain he'd received from an artisan in Jing the Zhen. Kiln, transmut kiln transmutation, the literal meaning of yao bian, was a well-known phenomenon long attested to in Chinese text, used for unexpected shapes, patterns, or color discovered on, on ceramic pieces after firing, sometimes treated as demonic and unwanted, sometimes prized as rare and delightful. The late Ming, connoisseur Gaolian, who falls into the latter camp, offered this explanation circa 1591. Yao Bian are magical transformations wrought by high and low shifts in the fire. Otherwise, the principle is unknowable, which would seem to make these effects even harder to obtain. But as Alan Huang emphasizes, Yao Bian is also used in hagiographic accounts of male artisans or their female relatives voluntarily hurling themselves into the kiln. The result of their self-sacrifice is to assure the success of a difficult desired result in the firing, while their bodies are literally transmuted into ceramic matter in the process. Such martyrs may be subsequently credited with certain technological innovations and worshipped as a Yao Shen, the tutelary trade god of a kiln. Red glazes in particular triggered such miracle tales, not only because they were technically so challenging to produce, but also because of the visual similarity to blood. And blood, as we've already seen, is physically and symbolically linked to women. In most of these legends, it's the sacrificial blood of a young woman that transmogrifies in the kill, giving her name lovely red or bright red to the glaze fused onto a vase and turning her into a goddess. Yao Bian then refers both to the mysterious, unpredictable forces at work in porcelain creation and to the deified artisanal crea creators whose self-destruction succeeds in controlling those forces. It's easy for a viewer to imagine a connection between these legends about the transformation of human blood in the kiln and a large set of porcelain works simple, simply entitled Vessels by the contemporary Chinese artist Li Jianhua. In this work from um, In a Cup and Bowl from the series, which was done in 2009, inside and outside, the white clay substrate and the colored surface glaze are dramatically reversed so that the red sang de boeuf or ox blood glaze, shimmering like blood, literally becomes the contents of the porcelain vessels. 
And this work was part of the exhibition Porcelain Material and Storytelling at the Smart, curated by Wuhan that uh, accompanied the ballet as a kind of, I call it like a pop-up exhibition because it was only on for three weeks and it was done um, on a shoestring and at the drop of a hat, but it was really wonderful. And it was a very sort of meditative exhibition that did capture some of the feeling of porcelain. So I come to my last section of the talk, um, which is called Animating Porcelain in Contemporary Chinese Art. Uh, which also uh, will discuss another work that was featured in that exhibition, also an, early, an earlier work. The contemporary uh, Chinese artist Geng Xue brings together the many thematic strands I've discussed so far in a short stop motion animation film of a miniature world composed entirely of blue and white porcelain, trees, figures, flowers, scenic backdrop, all made in Jing Dezhen according to her own design and all lit and shot to enhance the alluring erotic materiality of porcelain, its luster and reflectiveness, its hardness and fragility. Composed um, by Wu Huanqing and Wang Jingyu, the film score is interspersed like Sugar Vendel's music for the Ballet de Porcelain with the haptic sound effects of tinkling, tapping, scratching and cracking adding to the visual illusion by immersing us in a sound world of porcelain. And it's interesting because the test for Chinese connoisseurs um, traditionally of porcelain is, is the sound it makes when it's tapped, something like the way we judge crystal by the sound it makes when it's tapped. Um, the film is um, based on a brief uh, 17th century fantastic tale from Pu Songling's magnum opus, Strange Tales from a Chinese Studio, Liao Jai Di Yi. But the story that Geng Xue chose, Mr. C, and you can see it there, Hai Gongzi, it's not a well-known or even a particularly strong one, but many elements uncannily overlap with the Ballet de Porcelain, an, unchan an enchanted island, a romance, and an evil sorcerer vanquished. But here, it's a giant blue and white sea serpent, the Mr. C of the title. There's no mention of porcelain in the original tale, which I think makes Geng Xue's adaptation of it into an animated film composed entirely of this substance and its magical interactions with light, liquid, and sound all the more amazing and original. So the film begins with a young man rowing himself out to a mysterious island where he finds marvelous scenery. I should add that the film is very short too, it's only 13 minutes. Geng Xue harnesses the, so here's the young man with this backdrop of, yes, porcelain trees. Geng Xue harnesses the magic of animation to conjure up a tiny blue and white wine pot and cup to metaphors out of clay to serve the young man, and then shows the beautiful female inhabitant of the island emerging, being born, piece by piece out of a flaming sagar. A sagar is a ceramic enclosure used in the firing of porcelain to protect it inside a kiln. Um, so here she, she quite again shows this woman sort of being born from clay. It's love at first sight. Um, again, one of the ways in which they communicate so wonderfully in the, in the film without talking is by tapping themselves. In the midst of their lovemaking, they hear the sounds of something approaching, crashing in the brush, and an intertitle announces, Mr. C is coming. The woman abruptly smashes into pieces. This is a brilliant stroke on Gung's part to have her shatter as befits the material substance of porcelain rather than simply disappear in Pu Songling's original story. So here you see her now smashed and I think you can see her now the cloak of red she's wearing starts to merge with blood. Struggling for his life as the serpent sort of comes forward and coils itself around the man and then starts extracting and drinking his blood from his nostril the young man finds himself suddenly staring at a broken fragment of his lover's face. He drops this fragment along with the poison from a blue and white vial of, that he happens to have in his, in his sleeve. And he drops this vial of poison into the puddle of red blood at his feet. This instantly kills the serpent, but unexpectedly also shatters the man to bits. The film ends with a shot of him 
lying on the seashore, restored to life, an intact porcelain figure again. The violent history of porcelain's creative and destructive powers is once more concealed behind the material's smooth, shining, beautiful surface. And so to end, I'll just juxtapose two striking parallels be between um, the artistic language of this film and the Ballet de Porcelain. Thank you. And just to add one word about the Ballet de Porcelain, um, Oakland Ballet, for those of you in the Bay Area, is purchasing the Ballet de Porcelain's production. And its West Coast premiere will be on March 24th to March 26th at the Oakland Cultural Center as part of its Asian Dance Festival. I think that uh, Xiao Jie will put the link in the in the chat. There'll be different dancers, but I had no idea when I proposed this topic for Sophie that you would have such a, such a such a immediate chance to see it. Uh, so here's some information, and there's also a link. Um, and and that's the end of my talk. If we have time and you want to, I can play you the trailer. It's like a two and a half minute trailer for the. Um, um, for the um, Mr. C animated video. Let's, Thank you. Let's play the trailer. That was wonderful, Judith. Um, I do have a couple questions for you while we wait for the questions to come in. I see some are already coming in now, but um, let's play the trailer. I'd love to see it. Okay, well, you were gonna ask me why she chose, let first ask me why, okay. let me first tell you why the one question is, why did she choose this story, which I sort of puzzled over. It's really, I also translated it for the brochure um, that came out um, it, to accompany the porcelain uh, exhibition um, material and storytelling at the Smart Museum. So I had a pretty uh, close um, engagement with it. And it's really a kind of meh story for Pusong Ling. Um, and a fairly simple one. And then, so I have two thoughts. One is the very fact that it's very simple gave her a lot of freedom, which is one of the things that I you know, think is sometimes important when you're transposing from one medium to another. But the second reason is gonna become very clear when you see, I think, when you see this video, which is, I think she was influenced by the film, Tian Yu Youhun, the Chinese ghost mm -hmm. story, which doesn't feature a giant snake as a, a monster, um, but it does feature, you know, it features a giant tree root that really looks like a snake. Um, and so in this trailer, Hai is, is sort of much less meditative than the film. It's much more both in sound and in editing, um, more like a horror and sex and sort of erotic film. So anyway, we can play it.
Wow, that was amazing. I'm so glad you showed that to us. Um, looking at it and realizing, well, you can say, why did she, why did Geng Xue choose a story? But you can also say, why did she choose porcelain? Right. Well, that... so what is it about porcelain as a material that lent itself to the story? Right. I mean, I was thinking from her own, you know, this was her graduation work, actually, mm -hmm. from the sent from her, I think, MA, MFA um, at the um, Central Conservatory, at the Central Academy of Fine Arts, you know, the Zhongyang Mei Shu Xuan. And um, she sculpted all the pieces herself. And she's also circulated this work in installation form. But I feel that it's somehow much less effective. So a lot of them are miniatures. Um, and you can see that in the opening poster that I showed. I think that's sort of, she has some shots of really what looks like an installation rather than um, the animated film. Um, why she chose porcelain, I don't actually know. But I think that she really you know, maybe that, you know, again, it's all of it. It's such a, um, it is such a magical substance in terms of its sound, its hardness, its fragility, its reflectiveness, its glassiness, its, and, you know, even though I, um, I was going to say that what's interesting too is not only does this porcelain not really the subject of sort of literary representations, so there aren't stories about individual objects that become what you would call Sophia, in your forthcoming book, a charismatic object, you know, a kind of an object with sort of loaded symbolism, but it doesn't even really have much sort of poetic footprint, you know, it's not a metaphor, it's not really anything, but that doesn't mean that it isn't nonetheless sort of, sort of deeply somehow embedded in a kind of, into a kind of cultural consciousness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I wondered whether she could possibly be engaged in sort of any of the sort of same movements that Phil Chan might be engaged in. And I, I think it's really hard to think about porcelain without thinking about geopolitics in some way, right? Like you think about the race for true porcelain. Um, I think, you know, you and I have talked about the fact that um, actually Kangxi was, you know, engaged in almost like a mirror reversal, like if, Augustus II was engaged in trying to discover the secret of true porcelain. Kangxi was trying to make glass like Western nations could, right? And there's that conversation with his tutor, Gao Shuqi, where Gao Shuqi is kind of buttering him up. And he says, oh, now that we can make glass like this in the imperial workshops, you know, we are the equivalent of any Western nation. This is a sign of good governance, right? So there, there's, I mean, there's a sense that this is a technical marvel Right. And mm -hmm. just as today, like having, you know, being strong in tech is super important, um, you know, for geopolitical dominance. So it's almost like you can see that in the porcelain bearing tree story. Yeah, ge yeah geodominance. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, it's not, all, yeah, like they can even be fooled by, um, you know, the, the fable of the porcelain bearing tree. But um, uh, anyway, so I just, you know, I wondered. I guess first what Phil Chan's and Meredith Martin's ballet is doing there in terms of dealing with the chinoiserie tradition. Um, I know Phil Chan has said this ballet is really important because he believes that it is the origin of later sort of chinoiserie gestures in the Nutcracker, mm -hmm. sort of gross caricatures, or I think you showed the, the finger pointing, uh -huh. right? Um, and I noticed that the costume designer actually took her blossom motif from the mice and porcelain of Augustus the Strong. So I wondered what she was doing there, right? That had to be a considered choice. Well, from what I understand, so that's the easy mm -hmm. part. I can answer that. Okay. I think it, there also was some Japanese um, wear that influenced her and maybe even some Chinese wear. But I think, you know, the costume designer was just interested, you know, just took what what she, I think she was not engaged um, ideologically in mm -hmm. this choice. I think mm -hmm. she just like this captured her own imagination, her decorative imagination. But I was sort of struck by that too. Hmm, hmm. Um, another question that before I get to the Phil Chan question or really what is this ballet really 
doing mm -hmm. and does it mm -hmm. how does it really deal with chinoiserie is to say that um, Ellen Huang came to I, I teach a class um, called the cultural biography of things and so one of the things that I was able to do with this bringing this belly to Chicago was kind of in, embedded in my teaching and um, Ellen Huang came and also participated in a panel and the, what she talked to our class about was a kind of almost reverse you know where um, we also went to the Art Institute together. So actually it occurs to me, it may have been when she, she was also talking about this when we were looking at porcelain at the collection of the Art Institute, that a lot of new glazes come in because Chinese, uh, Jingde Zhen is trying to imitate um, European glaze colors, like, like a kind of rose pink, a certain kind of yellow and so on. And she also said that Kangxi was trying, they were trying to, or the Qing court were trying to imitate certain Western porcelain techniques later on so that there was a kind of reverse of it. I think, um, but to answer the harder question, which I think is sort of what does this, is this, what kind of intervention does this ballet really make? Does it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So one intervention that it makes is, um, you know, it was premiered at the Met in their sculpture, um, in their sculpture court. Um, and it's, you know, it was performed at Chicago in this black box theater. And it's also being performed like right now, this weekend at Princeton in their sort of art center also, I think in a not, in a kind of, you know, regular kind of black box or dance studio type place. But the rest of the performance is not the Oakland one, but um, are going to be performed in Europe um, across sites that are either places like Sèvres, one of the, the famous French porcelain manufactory at the, um, at the Museo di Capo di Monte in Naples, which has the most amazing room made entirely of porcelain from the 18th century. Um, and in places in like the Bristol, um, the Brighton Pavilion in, in London, the Wadsworth Manor and so on. So there's a certain sense in which even just staging this ballet at those sites that are the sites of mm -hmm. essentially imperial or aristocratic um, porcelain collections um, from that European age is a kind of intervention. It's also why the ballet is designed to be performed in non-traditional spaces and is very flexible. Though they did complain that the Met stage was so tiny. They had like a little, almost like a little, like fenced in little platform. Mm -hmm. um, um, I think the other thing that that is, that they want to do though is it's part of his project of a sort of, it's not really like a cancel culture where you say, this is unacceptable to contemporary art um, audiences because of either the ideological um, undergirding of imperialism and colonialism and um, racism that lies underneath this that we can all see clearly now um, underneath Shinwasri. There are arguments that are even Shinwasri becomes a kind of way of trivializing China and demoting it from its its sort of position in the um, as a kind of uh, a beacon of hope and inspiration for enlightenment thinkers to a kind of sort of trivial decoration that sort of you know you find in women's rooms. So there's that kind of argument. Actually, David Porter has made that in some of his work on um, British uh, English um, chinoiserie in the 18th century. Um, so. So he doesn't want to just say like, let's just get rid of this. He doesn't, they also definitely didn't want to try and sort of really reconstruct it as how it would have looked as a Baroque ballet. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there certainly are lots of attempts to revive Baroque ballets and be, you know, try to meticulously reconstruct their, um, their context, their look as much as possible. And here, what I really liked about this project is there's a lot of historical research and scholarship that went into this, um, including the history of, of Orientalism in ballet. And as you mentioned, they he and Meredith both think that this is this ballet that was lost became influential um, in a lot of ways. Um, so did the fairy tales. The fairy tales sort of inspires quite a number of tales like Beauty and the Beast and one thing that we don't know about the, the fairy tale Beauty and the Beast is, um, is that in its original context, it's about um, this woman who sails to Jamaica and finds this prince 
this hideous prince who she has to Frankify. I mean, it's amazing when you actually look at some of these contexts. Um, so I think the fact that they're that they're taking certain historical elements and trying, but also trying to capture the magic and the original magic and beauty of Baroque dance and um, and porcelain. So it, you know, it keeps, he did, you know, keep Baroque steps. So he, you know, they're not on point for, ins for instance, in, in the ballet because dancer, Baroque dancers didn't dance on point. Um, clearly for him having, aside from Meredith and Tyler Haynes, who played, you know, who plays actually brilliantly and comically, it's a very comic uh, role, the, um, the mad uh, source of the sort of the evil, mad sorcerer he feels less evil than almost uh, sort of comical mm -hmm. um aside from him and um everybody else involved in the production was of you know asian or part asian descent and i think because part of his mission has also been the paucity of of asian um creatives involved in particularly for him his world the ballet world right. Right. Um, so at, in, in, in many different things. So that I think was a very, something for him felt like a really important intervention. So I think these are some of the ways, and of course the plot twist of turning, you know, the, you know, the, the European, the, the Chinese, the Chinese sorcerer who's vanquished so that Europeans have the secret of porcelain, it's reversed. Mm -hmm. And even this pagode, which is a kind of, European invention used as a source of caricature of Chinese um, is also turned on its head. Right. right. So, but, you know, I think, um, I hope you'll, you know, you should invite him to give a talk in the Center for Chinese Studies. Oh, that um, he's very eloquent and he's completing another, uh, you know, he has this book out called um, Final Bow for Yellow Face. He has a new book coming out on, or on the history of Orientalism ballet, which I think will be really important. And he's moving beyond ballet in a way that I think is also so important. Um, I think it, it's, um, so he's now the consultant for Boston Opera. Hmm lyric opera who are doing a production of Madama Butterfly, speaking of works that are really problematic and really hard to stage now and helping them. They have a whole like year long rethinking butterfly project that he's Great. involved in. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the metaphor that they use is Kintsugi, which if you remember when I showed you the, um, the cover of the brochure for the porcelain exhibition at the smart, there was a, trans, a vase called translated vase, which is made of by a Korean artist, uh, Yi Su right. Yi Su right. Kyung. Mm -hmm. That was kind of their their kind of motto, which is that you sort of you break it apart and put it back together in a sort of a new way to where you make mm -hmm. the flaws a side of beauty. So I mean, you know, it's a nice metaphor. And all the fractures are sutured together with gold, right? Yeah. Um, well, we have some questions already in the Q&A box, so let's go to those. Um, first one is from Grace Fong, who says, Judith, thank you for the fascinating talk. Really enjoyed it. On cultural resonance in Gengshu's porcelain figures, might there be reference to the miniature erotic figurines of couples that mothers supposedly commissioned for their daughters for their wedding, Innocence and its End? Well, I, I, I can write, I, I will write and ask her. I haven't actually been in direct correspondence with her, but um, I think that's a wonderful idea, Grace. I actually don't know. Okay, and then our next question is from Lily Xu, who says, um, Tang stories of porcelain objects becoming humans and legends of Yao Shen, where do you encounter these stories? If I were if I were interested to read more about these stories, where would you recommend should I start? Well, that's really interesting. For the Tang Dynasty stories are in the Taiping Guangji, wide leanings of the Taiping era, which is a Song Dynasty huge compendium that is is the best source for most of our. Um, Tang and earlier stories, and it's in the miscellaneous implement section. Um, 
there are other stories, there are other statues in it, there are other implements in it, but these are the only two stories that I've found about porcelain mm -hmm. statues. Um, so that would be one place you could look. Um, for, um, for the stories about, you know, these artisans, uh, well, firstly, Ellen Huang's work, I drew pretty heavily on it. And also a really great article only available in Chinese by the art historian Zheng Yan that talks about um, the 18th century famous um, sort of um, Han ban bannerman, um, bond servant, um, Tang Ying, and um, some um, pieces that he writes commemorating the um, one of one such artisan, and um, it's a really very brilliant article. But he looked through clearly his sources for some of this were simply like there are collections of legends from kilns that have been published in the modern era. Yeah, yeah, and you've mentioned Ellen Huang's work a couple of times, and I wondered if our audience actually understands um what you're you're talking about um when you know it just seems to me that when we're thinking about sort of the global search for for dominance through manipulation of these sort of technical processes what's really interesting about ellen's work is that there's this human element of self-sacrifice and i feel like self-sacrifice is kind of a valuation in the chinese tradition and not in the European tradition. <laughs> and that That's, accounts for these miraculous transformations, right? Right. Well, it's interesting because, um, you know, they become deified, um, of course. Um, and I think that part of this Ellen's project is, is you know, is part of another, um, I could say it's a, a scholarly movement to try and put artisans back into the equation, especially when we work on Chinese stuff. I mean, it's so much about, you know, these manuals of taste or tales or paintings of sort of, um, uh, you know, people looking at antiques or porcelains or coral. Um, and so I think this is, you know, Pamela Smith has this book, The Body of the Artisan. Dorothy Coe is another person in her work on inkstones um, to sort of see how much we can get um, to restore them to our, our consciousness. I think there are many ways in which this is going on. It's hard because the people who mainly wrote are the literati officials and so on with the Qing court of course it's a totally another ball game because we just have these incredible archives of of the um kind of procurement of objects and things and goods for the imperial household so people have really been using that and i think you know the attention to court drama of which liana Qing court drama liana's work is 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 part of that also is able to use these kind of imperial archives to try and get at things that are normally undercover we can't really get at them in, in ordinary sources Right. I mean, it's interesting how skewed our viewpoint is, actually, because the, the sources that we have are all the imperial sources, right? Um, but you mentioned the trend towards thinking about artisans, and then you mentioned earlier, right before we started, another trend, which is to move from objects to thinking about materiality. You know, I'm thinking of maybe Jane Bennett's um, uh, blanking, vibrant, vital matter. Vibrant, ma matter. That vibrant matter. Yeah. 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 Um, and our next question actually touches maybe on that a little bit. Um, so Catherine Neeser asks, have you connected your porcelain figures and Baroque ballet to Anne and Lin Chung's ornamentalism theories of thingness and object and Asian female per per performativity? Yep. In fact, at Princeton, you know, she's at Princeton and um, she is on the panel. And moreover, she used that translated vase, an image of translated vase for one of her recent um, talks. And she um, asked through Meredith for me to send her a, to see if she could get a copy of the film, Mr. C. So you are so on target with this, I think. And that is an avenue could be certainly pursued more. And it might be another answer 
you know, obviously ornamentalism is a, at least the way Anne Chung formulates it is a pretty recent sort of theorization of Asian women as skin and surface in views of representations of them. Um, but it's possible that it's sort of that that's there also in Gangshe's use of these porcelain figures or attraction to porcelain. Yeah, the, as a material. The contrast between the sort of chiffon and the porcelain was interesting too, right? In Gangshe's video. Yeah, and actually, I don't think you saw it, but when she opens the robe, she has a kind of cotton, partial cotton garment covering her, but it looks almost like burlap, not like a cotton burlap, not as rough as burlap, but kind of a rough cotton. And it's sort of interesting why it's there. I don't know whether it's to hide something, maybe, you know, because it was very hard to do this. And you, she decided not to, clearly not to hide the strings. So yeah. these are all like puppets, yeah. right? Yeah. So babies yeah. better or marionettes. Yeah. And including the way in which they are um, in parts, right? You know, it's not a single piece of porcelain, except in those, inst like that the installations are like little miniatures are in one piece, but the rest are made of pieces, um, pieced together, especially clear in the snake, actually. Um, but I did want to say one thing, actually, um, what I was trying to say sort of earlier when we were talking before was not the shift from object to materiality, but the shift of object to material and sort of also a rejection of materiality as being too abstract. So there's this, you know, this essay by the anthropologist Tim Ingold, which is a kind of polemic against materiality. It's called Against Materiality. And he wants us to go back, especially anthropologists, to go back to to material um, uh, uh, in an exhibition that uh, Wuhan curated uh, right sort of right before the before COVID called the allure of matter material art from China he tries to make a case of moving from object to material too and I think it's kind of a good counterweight to something like thing theory which is still very much about the individual object and what that does. And I have mainly had before this mainly worked on individual objects because I like case studies. So I was able to do things like the cultural biography of the thing. But material is a whole sort of different ballgame. Well, that, that actually does lead right into our next question, which is um, from Xiang Junfeng. Um, thank you so much for the wonderful talk, Professor Zeitlin. A small question out of curiosity. Porcelain often evokes our imagination of a traditional China. But in socialist China and the earlier years of post-socialist China, when Gengxue was born, the most prevalent porcelain human figure in China's everyday life was probably the statue of Chairman Mao. Yeah. Does this ideological backdrop have any relevance in these contemporary art forms, at least on a politically subconscious level, politically in parentheses, um, or does this history change our understanding of these contemporary arts in any way? God, that's a really, firstly, thank you for making that point. It's a really good point and it definitely could be pursued further. I think that maybe one way I can answer is kind of a sort of a different political way of thinking about it. Um, you know, now those porcelain statues of Mao we might think of as just pure kitsch, um, just like the, the, maybe it has parallels with the Budai statue in how it's sort of later reconfigured, but not really because Mao was also deified. So maybe that's another way it is. Um, where I might answer is a little bit about another shift that's kind of, I think, remarkable for Geng Xue and certainly for Liu Jianhua, the, um, the porcelain artist whose work with the, the, the um, with the, 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 the blood glaze um, makes. So he is that porcelain was not typically considered an art form, right? It's, it was a craft, it was a, you know, a, a gong yi, right? A, it's not, it was not a high art form and it was mainly linked to various forms of production. And so um, 
Liu Jianhua, well, he was, he's from Jingdezhen and his uncle worked in the foundry, I guess, since he's born in 62, he would, would have been during the Cultural Revolution. And he was sort of, sort of apprenticed to his uncle. So he really, unlike most, you know, most art, art, conceptual artists now, you know, commission their work, to, not commission it, they farm it out to have other people actually make it. But he really understands the material. And so he's able to push it to all sorts of ways. And then he graduated from something like called the, the Fine Arts Sculpture School of Jingdezhen, something like that where they were sort of, but still you were sort of making statues for the trade. So I think the difference between a kind of trade and art, and I think these artists in using porcelain in these creative ways or pushing the material in ways that it's not intended to go in, that is, is a very, I think, a sort of a different kind of political intervention. So Liu Jianhua's cup and bowl, um... The sound above, actually, I mean, you can't really tell from the photo, but I wanted to ask you, is it meant to be like a bowl full of liquid? Yeah, it's what it really looks like. You can't really quite see it so well in the photo, although it still shimmers. I think what he did is he made a bowl with a solid ceramic core, hmm. and then he glazed it. Hmm. So the outside is glazed with like a kind of white celadon looking and then he glazed this solid core, but what it, the, it gives you a kind of trompe l'oeil illusion right. that the entire bowl is filled with liquid. It reminds you of like the Qianlong, like Dong Po Ro, right? or yeah, the sort of trompe l'oeil substitution of substance yeah. things. Yeah. yeah, and he does, he likes to play with that. There's a famous work of his, um, which was exhibited in the um, Allure of Matter show, which is paper thin porcelain. And it just looks, you know, how you could even get the material that thin, you really had to understand the limits of the material like Liu Dinghua does, mm -hmm. but it's a complete trompe l'oeil. You really think it looks exactly like a piece of paper. And only if you touch it, do you realize that it's paper thin porcelain. Mm -hmm. So our next question is from Susan Eberhard, um, who's one of our graduate students here working on uh, material culture. She says, wonderful talk, fascinating set of cases. I was also reminded of Ariel Fox's work on pre-modern Chinese stories of transformations of silver and other monetary objects, such as coins into human form. And I've also encountered tales of silver and money becoming animated in mysterious ways in early Qing texts. How do you see the transformation of porcelain as distinctive from other transmutating materials or commodities or operating in particular contexts? God, these are really great sets of questions. Well, I'm glad you brought out my colleague Ariel Fox's work. That's, she has a wonderful article on, on, on money people um, and how you can chart changing ideas towards money through these stories. Um, I think what's surprising about porcelain is there's so few stories. There's just so little of it, um, which is kind of interesting. And I think that um, even, you know, to be fair, I sort of cheated a little bit in the talk because these stories, uh, the money stories do continue, but a lot of these Taiping Guangjis uh, Taiping Guangji stories about the sort of the, these sort of are really part of a kind of, I think, leftover Tang demonography and of, of which sort of mysterious creatures appear who are really demons and you have to exorcise them in some ways, but these get, many of these get coded in a kind of comic way. And I've written about them in a piece called The Ghosts of Things, but they kind of die out in the records of the strange and transformations tend to be more on the, of um, organic material. Um, or things like rocks or flowers or fox animals or, or you know, it, there's less of these inanimate objects of which money seems to be an exception. Um, so I wonder if you've come, I'd be interested if they come across kind of other things. I mean, another way you can sort of see a surprising um, absence of porcelain is that one genre about writing about things as if they're alive is what you could call the pseudobiography or the object biography that is that originates by uh, with um, the Tang writer Han Yu in um, 
his Ma Ying Zhuan, which is the biography of Fur Point in Nienhauser's translation. And that, um, you know, it's a kind of elaborate um, sort of joke of, of scholarly illusions in which you write about an object as if it's a person using all kinds of sort of inside erudite things. It's really can be very hard to even know it's not a real person. And there are a lot of those and I couldn't find anything on anything made of porcelain, for example. You know, there are a lot of far-fetched topics, but yeah. So um, if anyone does find more on porcelain, I would be um, coming alive. I would be interested. Okay, so this is probably our last question, unless somebody is out there typing <laughs> and wants to hit the send button. Um, so it's more of a comment, but you might have some thoughts on it. Uh, beautiful talk and exchange. Thank you. I need to think through the shifts and layers. I'm trying to consider the space and time of gesture within your incredible examinations of materials to bodies to movement. Okay, so I think in terms of gesture, there are really clearly sort of two places in the talk that I gave where gesture is important. Um, one of them, of course, is in the ballet, and they're a sort of almost ironic appropriation of certain as uh, caricatured um, signifiers of Chineseness on the ballet stage. And it is really amazing. Um, and these derive from often from the pagode or the hats that they're wearing or the sort of in the in the um, actually if you um, sky can is it possible to show my first slide again because in there you'll see they definitely character that gesture that the um, sorcerer having been turned into the pagode is making is another sort of typical caricatured Chinese gesture and in the sort of you see especially the way his legs are turned out, mm. you know, his knees are, 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 are turned out and his, his, his feet are kind of turned in and he's doing this kind of, it's, it's clearly grotesque. And this idea in Baroque ballet that there were grotesque movements reserved for say foreign figures, whereas um, the dancers were elegant, gallant, you know, um, and what's interesting and very different from any kind of dance tradition in China is that, you know, aristocrats also danced. Louis XIV danced. I mean, this was seen as a courtly art. Um, so that's one place. And there you, um, I think there's some really great illustrations in this, in this volume, Reimagining the Ballet des Porcelaines, which will make the case pretty, pretty well. Another place, of course, is in the film at the end. And there, you know, the gestures are also mysterious. Like why is tapping yourself a way of conveying love and attraction? And she's very good at somehow being able to, to from these, you know, literally masks, these porcelain masks to somehow convey emotion through sound, through angles, through, um, But I, you know, gesture is an under-researched, still an under-researched subject. The history of dance is a, in China is also an under-researched topic. There's some work that's being done on it in which I think gesture is being looked at. So for instance, uh, Yu Hong Li's um, relatively recent book, Re, um, Becoming Guayin has the first chapter is on dance. It's so by far the hardest chapter for her to write because there's so little material. And then Emily, and for the contemporary period, Emily Wilcox has been doing really good work on Chinese dance. But, um, and of course there is a, an Institute of Dance Research in China, in Beijing as part of their um, National uh, Academy for the Arts, um, but still for gesture and I think for dance, we have a lot of work still ahead. Mm -hmm. Maybe you'll take it on. Wow, Judith, thank you so much. It's so great to have you here. However, virtually, it's just been such a fascinating discussion. So much fun to do this together. Yeah, so it was really fun. Um, thank yeah. you all for your questions and for coming. 
Thank you all and good night.